Good morning. We're going to start our song service this morning with Morning Has Broken. It's number 44 in the SDA hymnal. We're going to um, sing our theme song as we open up our meeting in the garden. If you don't know it, listen for the first verse. It's not hard. Um, and then join us.
Good morning. Welcome to Thursday morning. Um, how many have gained a blessing so far? And you guys, I'm sure, have all learned new things. I learned something new last night. I've never seen it on a graph, but things take longer than they than you think they will. And anyway, that was new to me. Um, so I have a few announcements this morning. The basil and the lettuce classes have been switched, and the basil class will be today, tomorrow. Okay. So the basil will be tomorrow, and the, and the lettuce will be today. So. Um, just look at the board again, because she switched it. So, um, then the youth choir will be here today at 3 p.m., and that's for ages 15 to 32, no older. Um, and then I don't know if you guys have seen in the, the, the class description, the little booklet, there's a C in there, you know, there's like beginner, intermediate, and the C, do you guys know what the C is for? Child, children, cutting edge, all those things. So that is designed, this is a new track this year for small, younger children. Um, I mean, you can, anyone can go there. So, But we're going to try and have it fun, interactive. Um, so just wanted to let you know about that. And then, um, so this morning... We have a uh, man by the name of Dr. Teske, and we go back like 15 minutes. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to see what he has to say. Um, that's, the, that's one of the fun things about these conferences is you get to meet lots of new people. And um, he's from Central California. He's an ER doctor. Uh, he works a lot with the Weimar Institute, doing lectures, classes, trainings. He's also the chairman of the board for Secrets Unsealed, and he has been gardening his whole life, and he's passionate about greens and um, different things. So, anyway, I'm going to pray, and we'll listen to him and see what he has to share. So, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we're thankful again that we can all be here. Um, we know that this message is an important message for this time, and... We're so thankful that you have raised up this movement, and we pray that you would be with Dr. Teske, that you would speak through him, send your spirit to you. fill this place, Lord, that we can learn more um, of the message that you have prepared for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, my objective this morning, to share with you, I'd, I'm really glad to be here. This is the first time I've had the privilege of meeting such a great group of uh, organic farmers and uh, people that are into something that has always been an interest of mine all my life. Um, I've given little things on it, but this is my first time to share with you something in a little more depth. My objective this morning is that when I'm done, you will understand that greens, fresh greens, are an essential food group. And you will be so convinced that you will have greens every day for the rest of your life here on uh, <laughs> this earth. And uh, the second part uh, is the simplicity and ease of uh, growing, preparing those greens, and uh, we'll continue some of that in the breakout session later this morning in one of the things about how easy it is to grow these, uh, this essential food group that uh, God has given us. Um, now, thinking of essential food groups, when I grew up, I was told there were four essential food groups. 
Um, many of you may identify this. Uh, this started, was first put out by the government in 1956, and uh, these uh, food groups continued on for decades. This was the official, not only government position, but this was taught in the schools, in nutrition classes, from grade school up through, uh, you know, very much higher levels of education. Did you know that this isn't the first time the government told us what we should eat? Um, back during World War II was actually the first time the government officially told us what we should eat. And back then they had seven food groups. And uh, this was one was before my time, so, uh, but I find in there is they had the green and yellow vegetable group. Then they had oranges, tomatoes, and uh, grapefruit group here. There was potatoes and other vegetables and fruits group. There was milk and dairy products group, meat, poultry, fish, and eggs group. And there was the grains, your bread, flour, and cereals. And then there was a whole separate group just for butter and margarine. <laughs> and, uh, and then at the bottom, you notice they added, in addition to the basic seven, eat any other foods you want. So it was a pretty wide open advice right here, but they wanted us to be healthy and this was the uh, consensus that they came up with. But uh, shortly after that, they came up with the four food groups and summarized it down and we see fruits and vegetables was one of the four, greens was one of the four, poor cows, they made up two of the uh, food groups. <laughs> uh, but that continued on for, uh, when I went through medical school, this was still the official nutritional uh, advice. First time they realized that probably that wasn't the best plan, 1992 we came up with a food pyramid. Now many of you may have remembered seeing this. Now they realized there was a hierarchy in what we should eat and that the bread, cereals, right, the grains made a foundation of a healthy diet. We build our diet around grains. Fruits and vegetables make up the next level, and uh, meat and dairy products got relegated to a more reduced minor role in the diet, and of course, uh, sugar and oil refined products, you know, junk food got pushed way out here, eat sparingly only group right here. And so this became the more balanced food group. You'll notice something else they added at this point, which had not been recognized before in the official advice, and that was that dry beans and nuts were included in now what they called the protein group. In other words, meat in and of itself wasn't essential, protein was essential. And uh, they recognize now officially that beans and nuts, you can get all the protein you need in beans and nuts. You don't actually have to eat the meat and the fish here. Um, now, but even with that, the, the, the dairy industry and the meat industry here were not pleased being relegated to a more minor uh, position in the food pyramid. They wanted to be the basis of a healthy, hearty diet. And um, political pressures being what they are and lobbying efforts, they modified the uh, food pyramid. Here in 2005, now we had a pyramid and it was all divided up in these little wedges here. So now everybody could be at the basis of the food pyramid and be the foundation of a healthy diet. And so now dairy products has a little wedge here and protein, notice, notice even in the full label now it says meat and beans. So they realized that hey, a plant-based diet is a very acceptable form of protein here. And of course, but still grains got the widest wedge of the uh, pyramid here and your fruits and vegetables and this. So together, fruits, vegetables, and grains got a fairly large strength. Somebody says, well, we shouldn't leave out exercise. They put steps on the side of the pyramid. And I even saw one that had a glass of water here over floating in the clouds here. Uh, so uh, they were trying to throw everything they could to give us the best advice while still meeting the pressures of the uh, dairy lobby. Uh, but shortly after that, uh, this is the most recent official advice, and you may have seen these posters around. They came out uh, 2011, and uh, here they have now just put it all on your plate and sort of divided up portion sides. And notice they've given grains a pretty good size, protein, vegetables a good size, fruits a good size, and you notice the word meat kind of drops off and they just labeled it what it really is. Protein is essential. 
And uh, Derry still uh, insisted, and they got a glass of milk on the side of the plate here. So that is the latest official government advice. Uh, many of you may be uh, familiar with PCRM, Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine, Neil Bernard out of Washington, D.C. He came out and has published his own version of the My Food Plate, and he's increased the proportion of vegetables and whole grains significantly. He's relabeled protein legumes, and uh, the glass of milk has disappeared there. So. Those are the official ones. Uh, I like the last line of your song this morning, uh, Eden's Plan, something really special in Eden's Plan. If you ask a group of Adventists what's the official diet uh, that they would recommend, what do they have? You know, they point us back to the Eden diet. And, uh, and what was the Eden diet that God gives there? He's given us all the fruits and trees and everything with seeds and stuff there. All of these things start to be our food. And uh, probably accept that that probably is the official diet. Uh, you know, it fits pretty close on uh, that food plate uh, that PCRM came up with. So science is kind of catching up to what gave us there. But I'd like to bring our attention to something else that happened in Eden the fall, and things changed then. They left the perfect garden and they went out to live the life and we continue as their descendants to live the life in this world that is now greatly marred by sin. And uh, thorns and thistles came up. Farmers are more aware of that than anyone else in this world spent a lot of our efforts fighting weeds. Um, physical exercise became a much more essential part of life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread for the rest of your life. And so hard physical labor became out there. Um, it's not really a curse. There is a blessing in the physical exercise we get. And there was one other thing. As they left the garden, God instructed the angel to pass on the instruction to them, eat the green herbs. Eat those herbs of the field. Eat the green herbs. And that wasn't just a punishment, you know, yeah, you used to have cherries and peaches, and now you just got to go eat some leaves too here, you know. Life's a little lower and worse now. There was actually a reason for that, and we'll come around to that uh, as we... Uh, come to a, before we finish this right here, we now can understand some very unique metabolic reasons why God added greens then, and I think you'll see it will be very helpful to you to add those to you. Uh, he who created man and understands his needs appointed in Adam his food. Upon leaving Eden, man received permission to eat also the herb of the field, these foods prepared in simple natural manner as possible are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect. You know, these greens are there for a purpose, and they really are in, in imparting a blessing to you. The next big change came at the time of the flood. And the landscape uh, was changed much more drastically than it was at the fall. And when Adam came out of the ark, an agricultural lifestyle growing his food of fruits and vegetables, legumes, and greens was going to be exceeding difficult on the barren dirt and rock that was left for him now to start farming here. And God said, you know, used to live on fruits and vegetables and greens, but uh, now I just give you everything, eat anything, whatever it takes to get the nutrition you need. And he reminded them back to that event at Eden. He said, as I gave you those green plants when you left Eden, he says, now just go ahead and eat anything. Um, of course, even though he told them to go ahead and eat anything, even then he tried to restrict them to the more healthful the animals went into the ark, how? Two by two, right? 
and the clean animals went in by sevens. And so they had the opportunity to start developing flocks and herds of those that were uh, better. You know, if you're not going to be a vegetarian, at least eat the animals that are vegetarians. Uh, that's going to be better off for you than eating some of the carnivores and scavengers that are out there. So he even then tried it out, but he recognized that, uh, you know, there are many places on this planet, even today, with all of our advances and things, that you really just can't walk outside your door and get all the food you need very easily. You can't get the mangoes and strawberries and all of the stuff that would make a nice, healthy diet there. But the cows, they can go around and munch on grass all day. A goat on a barren hillside can get what it needs. And uh, you can eat the goat or the cow, and you're going to pick up the nutrition that he has extracted from chewing grass and leaves his uh, whole life there. So God is practical, meets us where we're at, and passes those blessings on to us. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. We'll talk some more about this in my other session, but uh, in your backyard, these are from my backyard, uh, it's real easy to grow green, so much easier than some of the other gardening uh, enterprises we take in, you know, to bring a plant to full fruit and get lush, healthy fruit out of it takes a lot more effort than just getting some green leaves started. You all know that as farmers. You know, you can get the greens coming up, and I'm going to convince you of the value of those greens here this morning. Uh, this picture is red Russian kale. It was known as hunger gap kale. You know, in olden days in Russia, you know, those long Russian winters when food wasn't available, you were supplied with the food from the summer before. And as you had harvested your harvest, brought them in and canned and stored, preserved, or put in the root cellar, the various things you had, as you ate those through the winter when snow covered the ground, by spring, you often ran low or ran out of those items. And as soon as it was the ground was workable, you got out and started planting your gardens again and sowing the field. But before you got your first harvest and were starting to harvest stuff, foods you could eat out of the ground, there was often a gap there where you run out of food. It was known as the hunger gap. Kale, this red Russian kale, very cold hardy while there's still snow on the ground. That stuff is, can sprout and grow and take off. And months before you're harvesting anything, you're picking these greens and eating them, and uh, amazing the nutrition. This was what brought much of the Russians through that hunger gap in this early spring when they ran out of their last year's food before the next year's crop came in. Uh, tremendous amount of nutrition in greens. Uh, you know, the, the cattle here have a message they would like to get across to you. <laughs> They, they have a vested interest in this. Uh, they're lobbying for this. Uh, you, you really don't have to eat meat to get your protein. Uh, I mean, look at all the muscle and they build, protein they build up there, just eating some greens there. Um, how much protein is in greens? Uh, beef. Uh, this may surprise a lot of people. There's 9.4 grams of protein in 100 calories of meat. There is 11.1 .1 grams of protein and 100 calories of broccoli. Things that are dark green have protein. Leaves have protein. If you just think of the biology of the cell, and I know some of you have looked at the biology of these things you grow, and these plants, every cell in a plant is full of enzymes and proteins that carry on the work of that cell. Every enzyme, every structural protein is protein. As you digest that, it's broken down into the amino acids, absorbed, and your body uses to build the various proteins you need. Green leaves are full of protein. Uh, and as far as a balanced thing, uh, here's a list of some of the essential amino, essential amino acids are one that really need to be in your diet. Now, there's like 20-some amino acids, and your body can make some of those out of other ones.
but there are certain ones that really need to be in your food source. If you don't have them, you can end up with food deficiencies, certain protein deficiencies. Uh, things are not going to work as well if you don't put all the raw materials in there. As gardeners, you know that if you don't have the right nutrition in the soil, you can't get it up into the plant. And uh, the same for you. If you don't have the right elements in your diet, you can't get the right full functioning of your body as it was meant to be. Here in this first column here is the recommended daily allowance of various of these essential amino acids. And in this next column here is 100 grams of kale. I mean, that's a small serving, actually, 100 grams, if you weigh it out there. But in a small serving of kale, look what you've got. That one small serving of kale had all your protein in it practically, right? I mean, this isn't adding legumes for your protein. This is just having a bowl of greens for your protein here. You had a couple of servings, and you're way over the top here. You all know what lamb's quarters are? As farmers, you should know. These, they're, they're usually considered weeds. They're one of those things you chop out and remove from your gardening area because they're crowding out the plants you want to grow. But uh, they're an excellent green, and there are many weeds that have green leaves. Uh, these lamb's quarters, just pick the leaves off of there, steam them up like uh, spinach. It's a great source. Look, look at the uh, amino acids in 100 grams of lamb's quarters leaves. I mean... It's amazing the amount of protein you can get there. Uh, we are connected with the rest of the life on this planet Earth. Did you know that the genome between humans and chimpanzees is only 4% different? Somehow God quoted in that 4% everything that makes us human compared to some of these uh, primates that uh, walk around here. Um, and if you think about it, you know, what makes you human is some of the abilities that are developed into the brain and coded into the making of the brain. But as far as every bone and muscle, all of the various enzymes in every cell that carry on metabolism, um, those are conserved throughout nature. I mean, we do studies on rats and mice and even on bacteria and you know, all these things because there was so much... In other words, God found a way of doing it, and so he used that over and over again. And we find all kinds of animals have the same sort of enzyme systems and metabolic systems, and so we can do research on them. Uh, but these are probably the most closely genetic related to us of the uh, forms of life in planet Earth right here. Uh, take a look at the diet. If you just study chimpanzees in the wild, what do chimpanzees eat? We find that fruits and vegetables here make up a large point of their diet here. And look at greens, green leaves. They're picking little green leaves and shoots and all that. That makes a huge part of their diet. Here's the typical human diet here in the United States. And a very s smaller wedge of fruits and veggies here. And look at greens. It's gone down to a microscopic sliver of greens in the typical American diet. We've added a huge amount of grains here. And huge amount of meat and animal products, and we added a bunch of fat to it here. Um, could this lack and difference here in the greens area be contributing to uh, much of the disease that plagues us today? Now we're going to do an experiment. Uh, follow this. I think you're going to like this. We're going to pick some beets from our garden, and we're going to analyze these beets, and we're going to take the beet root here, and we're going to analyze what's there. And then we're going to analyze the greens, the leaves on top of the beet here, and see what's in the leaves and compare those. So if you start off here, protein, how much protein would you find? And these are a uh, weight. I think these are s standardized down to 100 grams of, you know, of root and 100 grams of leaf here. But in the beet roots, protein 1.61, the beet greens 2.20, that's 138% more protein in the leaves than in the root. Sugars. Ah, now we know why the plant makes roots. 9.76 and 0 0.5. All of the sugars that were being made with photosynthesis, plants sent them down to the root and stored them there. And uh, while I tout the benefits of greens, I'm not saying it's the only thing we should eat. Uh, we do need the fruits and vegetables, these roots. They store the energy, the fuel we run on, 
and an essential part of the diet. But going back up to the leaves, I want you to go through and look at some of these other nutrients here. Calcium, so essential here. The beets are 16, the beet tops 117. 731% more calcium, 731% more calcium in the leaves than in the roots here. Iron, 200, I mean, 321% more iron. Magnesium, over 300% more magnesium up there in those leaves. And we're gonna come back to that. To get a little more depth look of the importance of the greens, we're gonna come back and we're gonna spend much of the rest of our lecture taking a closer look at the green, the uh, magnesium and what magnesium actually does and why it's so essential and why so many Americans are deficient in magnesium and what it's causing here. But potassium over 200% more copper, vitamin C, 600% more vitamin C in the leaves than in the beets. Thiamin, 300%, riboflavin, over 500% more riboflavin up there in those leaves. Vitamin A, Wow, now it starts to go off scale here. 19,000% more vitamin A up in those leaves there. Vitamin E over 3,000%. And the top winner here, 200,000% more vitamin K. If you want vitamin K, it's in the leaves. And uh, I have another lecture, which today we're going to really go into magnesium, but I have another lecture. We spend an hour going through vitamin K and how essential and what it does. Maybe, maybe next year we can throw that one in here. But let's take a look. Why are leaves green? I know us farmers, you know the answer to this. Uh, the uh, chlorophyll molecule, which captures the energy from the sunlight, it absorbs the blue light spectrum here and absorbs some of the red light spectrum but doesn't absorb any of the green light. And so as the sunlight shines on the leaves and it sucks all the blue and the red out of that sunbeam, what's left? Green. <laughs> and so the green shines through the leaf, it reflects off the leaf, and you see green leaves because that's the plant's not utilizing that. But this molecule chlorophyll that's absorbing this red and blue light has right at its center a magnesium molecule. Every molecule of chlorophyll has an atom of magnesium right in the center of it. So you can see why green leaves are full of magnesium. We're going to take a look at how essential magnesium is in life and how essential it is to eat these greens to get that good dose of magnesium here. Did you know that 75% of Americans do not consume the minimum daily requirements of magnesium in their diet. So if you think what everybody eats, that does not have enough magnesium in it. Only a quarter of the country actually intakes enough magnesium. But even of that quarter that intakes enough magnesium, there are many magnesium depleting practices, and we'll take a look at those, that are depleting our magnesium levels. So even if you've got enough magnesium in the diet, you can lose it. Where does magnesium go in your body? Well, it goes inside of the cells. You see the cells up here? It's used in all kinds of life processes, and we want to take a look at some of those right here today. But all of these different parts of the cells, magnesium is an essential uh, element that is needed in so many of these uh, uh, life processes here. Uh, you compare that to the amount that's in the serum in your blood, only 0.3% of your body's magnesium is circulating in your serum of your blood. And yet when we, uh, the doctors order a magnesium level, well, let's see if you're deficient in magnesium. Let's draw a blood test. They they're measuring a serum magnesium level. Well, they're not looking at the other 99.7% of the magnesium in your body. And you can actually have a very normal serum magnesium level and the cells can actually be running quite depleted. They can be down 10%, 20%, 30%. They're still getting by on what's there, but their quality of function goes way down. 
you know, in your plants. And when you start losing certain nutrients, things don't work quite as well. And it's that way in the human body. If you're not having enough magnesium, if these cells don't hold all the magnesium they need, they're not going to be working properly. So uh, th there is a test that the doctors can do, and it's never done regularly, but it can be ordered if you're really concerned about your magnesium level. And they actually take a blood sample, and they pull out the red blood cells, and they do an RBC magnesium level. And in that case, they're actually checking an intracellular level inside the red blood cell, and we're getting a much better measurement of what is your actual total body magnesium, your intracellular magnesium levels, and that can give us a much more accurate. And that's where we start realizing that many people that have norms, normal serum levels are actually quite deficient in the magnesium stored in their body. Okay, the chemistry, this is the, the fun part, the lovely part here. But when you start looking at everything in life runs is catalyzed by enzymes. Enzymes do this, do this. Every life is a chemical reaction, a series of chemical reactions, and every one of those reactions is catalyzed by an enzyme. It adds an atom here, takes an atom off here, transfers an atom from here to there, all of these things. And many of these protein enzymes need other atoms in them. They need a zinc. They need a chromium, they need a magnesium, they need these different things in them. What does the body use magnesium for? Well, God in his wisdom has realized that if you take two magnesium atoms like this, they're just perfect to pull the electrical charge on a phosphate group just to the point that you can easily electrically add it on or pull it off of something else. And so every enzyme in the body that handles phosphate groups has two magnesium atoms in it. And uh, where do we use phosphate groups? Well, the DNA and the RNA, the codes of life, every cell is as replicating and dividing and making, is building new strands of DNA as it divides the cell. It's making new strands of RNA as it's reading the code to make the RNA. That's the blueprint it sends out to the ribosomes that are then gonna build whatever protein enzymes this cell makes. So we're continually building DNA and RNA in the cells. In this ladder, you know, you've got your adenine, thymine, and the various uh, cross things here that have the code, but the rungs of the ladder, the, the rails of the ladder here that hold them together in their place, there's a little sugar molecule that's attached here to the nitrogenous molecule that has the code, and then these sugar molecules, which are right here on each of these, are bound together by a phosphate group. And so as you build the chain and add the next piece on there to build the code, you're linking it together with a strong phosphate bond, a very strong bond. And every enzyme that's working here on building, repairing, making RNA and DNA, every one of those must have magnesium or it's non-functional. You make the enzyme and if you don't actually have enough magnesium to stick in it, that piece isn't gonna work. It's, it's, you might as well not have made it. It's not gonna work if you don't have magnesium. So when your magnesium levels go down a little, your, fun your ability to read the code goes down and your ability to divide a cell and duplicate the DNA goes down. Another place, uh, you know, inside cells was we break down the sugars and stuff to get ATP energy. And your plants, you're actually making ATP with sunlight and in the human body, we take, the, of course, the glucose from the plants, and now we break down and get the high energy bonds out of the glucose, but we make it into ATP. Inside of cells, whether you're plants or humans, we use ATP as to take the energy to whatever various reaction in the body needed it. And we often think of adenosine triphosphate, but did you know magnesium's properties here, those ATP molecules do not run around by themselves? they actually have a magnesium molecule chelated to them. They're actually an ATP magnesium chelate. Here, sometimes it'll bind on these two positions and sometimes on these two positions. But it actually needs to be in these conformations to be used properly by all the various enzymes that are getting the energy. So if your magnesium level is down and you don't actually have your ATPs, even if you're making ATPs to get the energy to what it's not chelating up with the magnesium, it's not being held in the right shape, so it can actually be picked up and used. If you want energy, you're gonna need to have enough magnesium there. 
And of course, how many molecules of ATP are in one cell? I mean, millions. And so you need a magnesium molecule for each one of them so you can use it properly. Uh, an idea of looking at this thing a little bit, this is just a teeny piece of the metabolism of glucose, how you get energy out of a molecule of glucose. So the glucose was in the food you ate and the various starches and stuff or sugars and it was broken down, separate. To get glucose here, we go through these steps. We add a phosphate on here, we move the phosphate to there, we, move, we keep moving it around and many of these, you see these little, there's phosphates here and this is only what we call the anaerobic glycolysis. This is just breaking it down before it even gets into the mitochondria where it goes through the Krebs cycle and is further broken down. Every single one of those steps that uses a phosphate is going to need magnesium. And if you look here at each of the little arrows, and you see the name of the enzyme by it there, do you see that little green magnesium symbol there? This enzyme has to have magnesium to work properly. The enzyme for this step needs magnesium to work properly. This one needs magnesium. This one needs magnesium. This one needs magnesium. This one needs magnesium. And if these enzymes don't have magnesium in them, they can't actually work. You can't extract the energy from the foods you eat. When you actually have all the magnesium, your energy machine is so much more efficient. They ran some experiments with some athletes. Uh, these were all uh, athletes are on a regular training program eating a balanced healthy diet for their training they are careful about their food and had their exercise routines they put them on a program where they added a quart of green smoothies every morning uh, green smoothies great stuff fill your blender halfway full of fruit fill it the other halfway full of green leaves a little water or juice blend it down drink that out. powerful energy in there uh, definitely they all had increased energy, increased endurance. The point at which in the marathon where the exhaustion sets in, the amount, it's like they could just keep going and going. They suddenly had this other thing. And these were people that were already doing the best they had and were good athletes and doing it. And suddenly they had all of this increased energy and endurance just from that. Rapid recovery times. Not only are we going to rebuild the glycogen stores in the muscles, those all take phosphate. They all need these magnesium enzymes to do that. But remember, you're repairing and rebuilding the DNA. You're building these, rebuilding these proteins. You need to, all those phosphate bonds to build the RNA and DNA. Very rapid. In other words, how many days after a marathon can you go out and start exercising again? You know, you really deplete the body. There's a recovery period. Very rapid recovery. Decreased inflammation. Uh, I'm not sure exactly to explain that, but remember... We're talking about one molecule, magnesium. There's lots of other nutrients in there, and we're not even beginning to mention the thousands of phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, and all of these other molecules. We don't talk a lot about them because we don't know a lot about them. But you know, God knew a lot about them, and he designed metabolic pathways to make all of those. There was a reason for that. And just because we don't know the reasons doesn't mean it's not an important reason. And when you start taking the food as he advises it, you know, when we come back to that Eden plan, including, you might say, the Eden exit plan, you know, one of the first things as I left the garden, what did he say? Eat greens. Yeah, uh, the, the first advice he gave to the fallen race as they left was eat greens. Um, how about the heart? Muscle cells need magnesium for proper contraction and proper relaxation of a muscle. They need it there. Uh, we need magnesium in the electrical circuits. Uh, these magnesiums have electrical properties as they move in the cell membranes and the electrical currents in the heart that conduct a heartbeat that we measure with EKGs and electrophysiology. Magnesium is essential for those to work properly. Um, with if, if you've got a deficiency in magnesium, your CHF is going to be worse. Many people with congestive heart failure and lots of meds, and nobody's putting them on magnesium supplements. Give them a serving of greens every day. Um, cardiomyopathy, coronary vasospasm. Again, remember, spasming, you know, you can go into vasospasm. There's a whole syndrome. It's like a heart attack, only it's not related to atherosclerosis. It's just adrenergic spasming of the uh, muscles there. Um, chest pain, myocardium, 
And you can see that all of these things respond. In the emergency room, I frequently will add a uh, IV of a couple of grams of magnesium to somebody with an arrhythmia in addition to the other drugs and stuff I'm using to try to you know, combat that um, arrhythmia in an emergency uh, situation there. Um, high blood pressure. How many people suffer from high blood pressure? Did you know you need a good magnesium to allow the arteries to relax properly? And if they can't relax properly and they're crunched down more than they should be, what's that going to do to the pressure? You're going to increase the pressure. And you go to the doctor, what's the first thing he's going to give you for hypertension? Yeah, he's going to give you a pill. And what's the most common pill we give? Hydrochlorothiazide, a diuretic, a water pill. Do you know what hydrochlorothiazide does to magnesium levels? It's dumping magnesium out in the urine. It says, let's get this magnesium out of here. And it's dumping magnesium out in the urine. So if you're on a diuretic, Lasix, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, spironol, you're dumping magnesium out into the uh, urine right here, depleting your magnesium supply. Well, depleting your magnesium supply is going to make your hypertension better or worse. Yeah, how does dehydration help? I mean, yeah, diuretics will dehydrate you. Well, if you get your uh, dehydrate enough, yeah, your pressure will drop. It will drop to zero at some point if we keep dehydrating you, right? Uh, dehydration is not really a strategy for health. You know, um, eat your greens. <laughs> Someone's got to stand up and say it. The answer is not another pill. The answer is spinach. You know, you, you got to eat these greens right here. Diabetes. Type 2 diabetics are universally low in magnesium there. And again, if you think about all of the energy uh, things that have to do with glucose metabolism, when your glucose metabolism is that far off, how much of that is being contributed by a magnesium deficiency uh, from our diet? Uh, eat the greens here. Fibromyalgia, they did some studies. Magnesium supplement actually reduced the pain and tenderness associated with fibromyalgia there. Uh, muscle cramps, spasms, again, for the muscle contraction there, what do we need? You know, let's get that magnesium back there. Uh, muscle spasms are frequently electrolyte imbalances, whether it's uh, magnesium, calcium, potassium, something like that. But magnesium certainly is playing a role in there and is something that if you're deficient, as so many people are, is a real problem. The brain, the, all of those neurons, the complex electrical circuits that carry on your thoughts, your thinking. This is what takes you above and beyond animals. This is what allows you to not only communicate with those around you, but to communicate with your creator. We commune with God in the neural circuits of the brain. Magnesium is absolutely essential for the proper electrical conduction down the axons, down from one neuron to the next as we carry out the various complexities of a human thought. Um, insomnia. Human beings spend one-third of their life asleep. Asleep is not nothing. Asleep is actually a very important part of the brain's activity. We're actually sorting, organizing, and cleaning the brain when we do that. Fascinating. We could spend hours talking about sleep and essential stuff there. Uh, magnesium actually helps you fall asleep faster, helps you stay asleep longer. It helps restore some of those deep sleep brainwave patterns, uh, can resolve restless leg syndrome, which uh, keeps a lot of people up. And many find that just with magnesium supplementation, the brain, their sleep patterns can get back to normal here. Uh, eat your greens. Memory and learning. They started doing studies by giving magnesium supplements to people and checking the brain, uh, the, the ability to learn, their short-term memory their, and stuff like that, the various other brain functions. Uh, they were using this magnesium L-trionate. It's a, uh, but uh, that's just a magnesium chelated to an amino acid there. Easily passes through the blood-brain barrier. But uh, what they found is start adding more magnesium, oh, people were smarter, they learned faster, they recalled better, everything was working better when there was enough magnesium in there. And of course, so many of these things work better with magnesium because everybody was kind of magnesium depleted going into these. Um, in the emergency room, any of you OB nurses here? Um, eclampsia. What's the number one treatment we do for eclampsia? 
uh, we've got to get the mag sulfate going right. We've got to pour the magnesium in there, get the magnesium back up. It's the only thing we can do to stop the seizures and the hypertension that goes with the eclampsia there. Um, asthma, bronchospasm. The, these airways all have little muscles and in asthma and COPD and stuff, they scrimp down really tight right there. Uh, one of the drugs that I add to every asthmatic in my ER, and this isn't just me, all the ER docs across the country are doing this, besides giving a bronchodilator drug and a steroid drug, I'm going to run some magnesium in. It really makes a difference in allowing them to, again, remember the arteries we talked about relaxing, the same with the air, relax those airways, open up, uh, really makes a huge uh, difference there. Low levels of magnesium have been associated with increased risk of developing asthma in both children and adults. Osteoporosis. Did you know that 60% of the magnesium in your body is actually incorporated into the mineral structure of your bones? We all think about calcium, but uh, it's not just calcium. It's calcium and magnesium and boron. And uh, yeah, you farmers, you put, you want to check the boron level in your uh, almond leaves uh, to know how much boron you need to put on to get the nuts to come out their best. Uh, your body needs it too. So we mentioned already 75% of Americans do not have the required amount of magnesium in the diet. But even if you take in the required amount of magnesium, you can deplete it. We already mentioned one thing, the uh, diuretic drugs. Um, there's another. Uh, what's the number one depleter of uh, magnesium in America today? It's the sodas. And it's not the sugar, the caffeine will, but it's the phosphoric acid. All these sodas have phosphoric acid. Well, we just talked about what's the relationship between phosphate and magnesium. Yeah, they chelate. They stick together. They've just got this affinity. They've just got the right electron pattern to uh, get together there and to bind together. And so let's say you went out to the and you went out and you had this delicious big green salad full of all of these dark green baby greens of all different kinds. You know it's high in magnesium. And then you finish off your meal with a Pepsi. Um, what did you just do? Well, the phosphoric acid in that soda went around and bound up every magnesium molecule in that meal. And now they're all chelated and bound up. And guess what? Now you can't absorb them. They're just going to pass right to you guys. So you just sucked all the magnesium out of that uh, wonderful salad you just ate with the soda you followed it with. So even if you can measure your diet and say, look at all the magnesium I ate today. But if you had a soda with it, uh-uh, it's gone. This, that out there. Um, God meant us to drink water, right? Yeah. I mean, what do you feed your plants? You water your plants. They need water. It's a universal solvent of life. Uh, we need to uh, water the uh, human body as well, not fill it full of phosphates that bind up our... Uh, um, there's another category of drugs that is a real problem. How many Americans are on various types of stomach acid blocking drugs? Uh, magnesium needs a high level of hydrochloric acid. It needs that acidic as environment to separate, to pull it off, and release it from the various uh, places it's bound in the food. We've got to you know, break up those chlorophyll molecules, break up these other molecules where magnesium is bound in the different forms of food, and release it so it can be absorbed. When you shut down the acid production here, you remove that acidic environment, uh, we're not actually digesting properly. I mean, God designed the cells and the lining of your stomach to make concentrated hydrochloric acid for a reason. We actually have to digest the food. We've got to go in chemically and just break these molecules apart to get the nutrients out so we can absorb them and they'll work good for us. Calcium supplements. A lot of people are recommending calcium supplements for your bones and the people are taking calcium pills and stuff. Well, in your 
intestines there, there's little receptors that actually grab a calcium ion and pull it inside, out of the gut, inside where it can go into the bloodstream. Well, the way God designed it, calcium and magnesium are very similar in size, and so he designed one tool does two jobs. And so this receptor grabs calcium or it grabs magnesium, either one. It can just grab calcium or magnesium, and all your calcium and magnesium that is absorbed is absorbed with this one thing. Now, if you just went and took a big calcium supplement with your meal of some kind, and now what's the percentage of calcium to magnesium, if they're assuming there was some magnesium in your food that you just ate, now suddenly, you know, we're a million to one more calcium molecules than magnesium. So which molecule is going to come up to the receptor as the food passes by? Well, it's almost always going to be a calcium because there's so many millions more of them than there is of the magnesium because of the supplement we took. So calcium supplementation will just competitively inhibition, it will just crowd out and you'll get very little magnesium absorption because they're using up all their absorbing ability on uh, getting calcium in because there's so much calcium there. If you're going to take a calcium supplement, they realize now, and you can get ones, they've got calcium and magnesium in a one-to-one -one ratio there. There's some that put out a one-to-two ratio, but either way, uh, that's a more, if you think you need to take a calcium supplement for some reason. What's the ideal calcium supplement? Oh, yes, my calcium was actually really high levels in greens. So if you're eating your greens, you're getting your calcium and your magnesium in the right amounts and the right proportions. God knew what he was doing when he designed food, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Your song says Eden plan is a, a lot better than anything else, right? Yeah, come back to Eden's plan now with your calcium and your magnesium. Caffeine. Uh, America runs on caffeine and uh, causes a lot amount of magnesium to be lost in the urine. Remember, caffeine is a diuretic molecule, so like the hydrochlorothiazide and stuff, uh, the, when the caffeine hits the kidneys, uh, you know it's a diuretic type thing. It makes water come out, but it's making water coming out by pulling magnesium out of your blood. So uh, the caffeinated drinks are pulling the magnesium out of your uh, body here. Empty calories, just plain old sugar. I mean, look at here. We've got white flour and white sugar. I mean, there is so much need for digestion of the white flour and the white sugar to get that process. Remember, Every single atom of sugar there is going to need magnesium and every enzyme of that chain to process it. And now, if we're given this much more processing to do and we don't actually have the magnesium to go with it, well, we've created a relative magnesium deficiency here. So, you know, pulling some magnesium to this, there's not going to be enough for building the DNA or something else there. Stress. Here we come full circle back to where we uh, started our lecture here. Stress is not just a thought in your head. Stress is not just anxiety, worry, fear, grief, guilt. It's expressed in a very real biochemical way in your body. If you're under stress, your epinephrine level, your adrenaline level is up. Your cortisol level is up. These stress hormones are produced by stress. Fear, anxiety, worry, guilt, grief. These are the results of the fall. God did not intend that to be a part of Adam and Eve's experience in a perfect world. But now, in the world we live in today, we can't get away from these. Even Jesus, uh, you know, when you think about it, he. Uh, had uh, to deal with grief and sorrow and pain here. He became one of us, and he uh, experienced everything we experience, and it was depleting out his magnesium as well while he was here. Um, and so we come back, what did God say? Supposed to eat the green herb of the field there? Yeah. Um, you know, the last night that Jesus spent before the crucifixion, the 
Passover supper, besides the Passover lamb and the unleavened bread and the wine, there was something else that was part of every Passover supper. The bitter herbs. By the way, are herbs bitter? Have you eaten dandelion greens? Everybody says, I, I know we can eat dandelion greens. Have you eaten them? <laughs> yeah, herbs can be very bitter. And even some of them, like arugula. I mean, hey, arugula is great. I like arugula salads, but you know, if you had to pick an adjective to describe arugula, it would be closer to bitter than most other uh, flavors. Yeah, the herbs can be very bitter. And God said, and he put that there. He said, uh, that was to remind you of your sojourn in Egypt and the bitterness of your bondage. And in a spiritual sense, you know, we realize the evil that sin has brought, all the emotions of bitterness and pain, and grief and sorrow. But God has provided the remedy. And uh, yeah, they're going to be depleting your magnesium. And so as Adam and Eve left the garden, eat your greens, eat your greens. They're going to help you through this. Um, uh, God was very wise, very loving. Eat the green herbs of the field. How do you eat the greens? Any way you want. Uh, salads are an excellent way to take greens. You can cook them up and steam them. I love that Russian kale. Just chop it up and steam it up. It's delicious. As for me, that's one of the best flavored greens out there is the Russian kale, but you'll find it. Uh, green smoothies. Throw the greens in the blender with a little bit of fruit and the thing. Take a little of that bitter herbness out of them. And uh, by the way, one thing I've discovered on the side right here, if you're putting in a lot of chard or spinach that's really strong, I take a lemon, throw a lemon off my lemon tree in there. Somehow that lemon and that together psh, goes together and the really astringent hardness of those particular greens, psh, it's gone, it's great. Drink it down, it's delicious. Take a green smoothie every morning like those athletes. You know, fill your body with energy and power. God has given us a health message for a reason. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be able to make it through the stresses of life. And uh, he gives us his love. We have faith in him. And he brings us through these things. But part of it, we show our faith by following his advice. And if he said to eat the greens, I mean, if you think about it, that's one of the first health messages ever given here after they walked out of Eden. They had, of course, the ideal diet in Eden. But on leaving Eden, before any of the other health messages down through the ages, eat your greens. That hasn't changed. It's still there. And uh, I highly recommend it to you. I hope I've done enough here. Just, and we've just looked at one molecule, the magnesium. We could go back and look at vitamin A, vitamin K, and on and on with all of these other things. Uh, God told us to eat greens for a reason, and we probably don't even know all of those reasons yet because we don't know what all of those bioflavonoids do and all of those phytochemicals and all of those other molecules in there. But uh, this is... Uh, his legacy to you, his gift to you. And as farmers, you're in a unique position to uh, take advantage of that and to pass it on to all the others to whom you supply food. Uh, uh, in my breakout session later here, I'll talk more about growing greens and how easy and simple they are. Anybody that hasn't been growing their own greens, uh, greens lose a lot in storage, even in the best storage going to market. Uh, they depleted of many things. Uh, you want to just grab those fresh greens out of the garden every day as you need them. It's really, really uh, powerful there. Um, as he mentioned at the beginning, I work with Secrets Unsealed closely, um, and I write an article, a column there, every time they put out a newsletter. And uh, if you want to take this down, secretsunsealed.org, you can go in there and just subscribe. There's a place to subscribe. You'll get on their mailing list. They can email you or send you a paper mail every time they send out one. Or you can get both. You can get the paper one and look up the email one. And you can read my articles in there. I've been doing that for several years now. All of the, my past health articles have been archived and put on the website there. 
So you can go on the website, look under the column where it says resources, and then look for health articles, and you can find, you can pull up the articles I've written there. Uh, always trying to share some of the chemical and biological and health knowledge that God has given us and bringing us back. Uh, we have a health message because God wants to heal us. And he wants to give us the wisdom to heal others. And it is through the simple plant nutrition that he plans to work. You know, when Christ was here, he went about healing by just touching somebody, and a miracle happened in work. And we are told, in the spirit of prophecy, that we cannot now work in that way because there are false healings. Satan goes about working false miracles, and we don't want to be confused with those. And so that passage is in uh, medical ministry. So God has marked out another way for us to carry on the same miraculous work of healing. And it goes on to describe the sanitariums, the health message, and these type of things. As we come back and do what God asks, he can work through that faith when you show the faith in God by doing what he asks, if he said eat the greens and you go eat your greens every day and then you come and pray to him to relieve your uh, various ailments that you're suffering from, can he work through that? Does he still work miracles today? But he works them through this new way that he has marked out for us here in the last days. That's his gift to us. That's how he's asked us to carry on his miraculous work of healing. And you as farmers and gardeners are in closer touch with the essence of that than anyone else to realize the blessings that come in the foods you grow and passing those on to everyone else. Okay. Thank you. Question? I'm open for questions, but I don't know if you have time in your schedule. Uh, I'm open to take I wish questions. We could take questions, but I think we have about ten minutes till the Dr. Tusky will be here today. But wasn't that amazing? Yes. Wasn't that such an encouragement? My husband's sitting there next to me saying, "We need to eat more greens." <laughs> <laughs> Good. That was my goal. <laughs> Every one of you should be feeling that in your brain somewhere right now. Sorry, I just realized that I was unmiked, but I got the feeling that you were hearing me. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I just want to encourage you, as I, um, Dr. Teske shared the place where he has written all of these health nuggets. People who are farming use that resource for your customers. You know, we have wanted to do more outreach to our customers. You, you are medical missionaries. You are health coaches. So, so use F feel that. Feel free to download them, copy them, and pass them around. You have my permission for the copyright to spread them and Thank share you. them, uh, everything I do. Uh, I think they recorded this lecture today. They're going to put it on, was it Audioverse? Mm -hmm. um, feel free to, you know, share that with people. Uh, everything I do is uh, I try to share and yes. get the message across. So, I wish we could have time for questions. Feel free to catch me in the hallways between lectures. Yeah. Come to my other, other session. Class. I think it's not the next one, but the one after that. Mm -hmm. I have a session. I'd be glad to talk in a smaller setting. And between times, after times, wherever you see me, I'll hang around. And uh, I, think, I, think, I think I'll stay here for lunch. So, uh, good. Thank you. We want to close with a, with a word of prayer. We want to thank the Lord for... Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us here this morning. Thank you for the wisdom that you have brought to us through Dr. Teske, for the encouragement, for the reminder that you have given us everything that we need in the green leaves. And may it be for our, not only our health and healing, but may we be conduits that would just reach the, our neighbors, our customers, um, with the amazing blessing that you've given us in the herbs. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hurry to your classes. Okay, you probably want to unwire all these microphones here. That was such a blessing. <laughs>
Well, good. I'm Praise glad. The Lord. What is the amount per day? At least one big serving of greens. Yeah. Okay. I don't and get two down. Is better. <laughs> you know, I don't get down to uh, everybody's needs and Oops. needs are different. I don't like to give real, you know, tight. Eat so many of this, so many of this. Uh, as many as you can, probably, right? Yeah, you know. I mean, again, it's not the only food. Yes. You know, we do need the beets, yes. and we need the apples, and we need the walnuts, and we need all of these foods. And we need the beans. But we often leave out the greens. I have a question for you, unrelated to health. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're Teske. Yes. German. What? German. Yes. Well, there's Teske in my... In my roots. Who's speaking here uh -huh. And when I first started following my thought, I wonder Apple. what his teskies are. Tonight. So, but there's no meaning in here right now Elizabeth? after this? Oh, Elizabeth. yes, Don't there is. Okay, we're okay. My family I know. over. I'm sorry. I'm
Test? One, two? Okay. So I just start, huh? All right. Morning. Good morning. How you doing? Good morning. <coughs> nice to be here with you this morning. And I'm just curious, how many of you are looking for your place in the country? Okay, then I think we're on the same plane, right? Headed to the same destination here. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this new day, this opportunity that we have to turn our attention to the call to the country. Pray that you would bless this time. Pray for clarity in my own mind. Pray for the Holy Spirit, angels to surround this place, and that your ideas could be conveyed to us as we spend this time together this morning. I ask a special blessing on each person who's here that they will receive that which you have in mind for them to get out of these meetings today, tomorrow, and Sabbath, where we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So the topic here, I think this is, uh, the title isn't exactly right, but I think it's supposed to be making the move, but it's the same idea, finding your place in the country. I wanted to take a few minutes to share with you our story. Every story has a beginning, how it all started for us. I used to start this story right around uh, Y2K because that was uh, a time in our lives for my wife and I that we had already felt drawn to the country. My, wi my wife grew up part of her younger years in an off-grid cabin and we were very interested in outdoors and connecting with nature and all of that. Uh, but right around Y2K, and it wasn't really the Y2K scare itself, but that did start to kind of turn things for us in our thinking. As Laura came home from Costco the last day of the year, and we talked about the incredible lines of people. I was pastoring in Carson City, Nevada at the time. And I'd really been going through a reconversion experience in my own life as a pastor. And so I was rediscovering the writings of Ellen White and the country living message. And so typically, you know, until maybe three or four years ago, that's where I started my story. And then something happened. About four years ago, my brother called me up and he said, hey, I want to go back to our old stomping grounds just for nostalgia. You want to go with me? And I said, sure. We grew up in Angwin. Anybody here been to Angwin, California, Pacific Union College? So <clears throat> I, it was seconds after he said that to me that something entered my mind. I said, you know, I'd like to see if we can find that trail that we used to walk uh, to school. So if you have been to Angwin, we lived on Mariposa Drive. Not very many people lived on Mariposa Drive, and yesterday in my intensive class, some guy comes up to me and he says, I lived on Mariposa Drive too. <laughs> <laughs> we walked down Mariposa Drive, took a left on Sky Oaks, and at the corner as it goes down the hill toward the old uh, Merck, uh, the house there at that time, it was the, uh, the Bernard's home on the corner. There was a little trail that just dipped. I had to, you had to know right where it was. It just dipped off the side of Sky Oaks and went down through the woods there. And so when my brother said, let's go back, I said, wow, I wonder if we can find that trail we used to walk to school. I was drawn to it. And then as I thought about it, I remembered a story that had happened uh, decades before. Three little boys walking to school through the forest, stopping for a pee contest. I'm sorry, I mean, it sounds kind of crass, but little boys do that. And while I was standing there in the woods with my two brothers, uh, looking out over the creek, sun streaming through the canopy of the forest, something grabbed me about the forest. And I had this thought, 
I want to have my own place one day with a forest and a creek and a trail, maybe a meadow. And ever after that, when we walk to school and back, uh, not necessarily at that spot on the trail, but somewhere along the way, I would think to myself again, someday I want to have my own place in the forest uh, with a creek and a trail just like this. Well, you know, life goes on. I'd forgotten that experience until my brother said, you want to go back? And we did go back together. We went to the elementary school. It was open. Nobody was there. It was open. We walked in and we're walking the halls just feeling the nostalgia. And the alarm went off. We weren't supposed to be in there. And we scurried around real quickly and got out of the building, loud speakers blaring outside. Leave the premises. Law enforcement is on the way. <laughs> I said, let's go find the trail. And we couldn't find it. I thought, you've got to be kidding. How could that be gone? I looked over the corner off of Sky Oaks, and I just saw houses in there now. And we went to the other end. I said, maybe we can find the other end. Can we just get to that place in the creek, you know? And we couldn't find it. What impressed me about that whole experience was a promise that I was reminded of that you know well, I'm sure, Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And what impressed me was I forgot what happened in the forest that day, but God did not forget. So this little elementary school boy with a country living dream, the Lord remembered that, and indeed, the, con the time did come where we have our place in the country and a trail in the forest and a little creek. And we've kind of gotten hooked on meadows. So uh, I went across the meadow looking back uh, to take that picture. And that's, the, that's our place in the country now. It's up in northern Idaho uh, in the Priest Lake area. Anybody been to Priest Lake? Yeah. Well, I want to take, uh, I want to try to fill this time as much as I can with practical things that are going to help you, but I did want to just quickly kind of go through our story because I thought it would be helpful. That reconversion experience I was telling you about that happened to me while I was pastoring, I was at Carson City, but we were drawn to nature, and so we asked that was something that you did, at least in those days. Maybe you still do this, but as a pastor, we asked, can we live at Lake Tahoe? I was pastoring in Carson City, and, there were, and I had an ace in the hole because at that time, Carson City, uh, Seventh Avenue Church, was connected with the South Lake Tahoe Church. So I said, since one of my churches is in Tahoe, albeit a small church, can we live at Tahoe? So they said, all right, you can do that. So if you've been to Tahoe, you know it's a beautiful place. While I was there, I was rediscovering the spirit of prophecy in statements like this, out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has been giving me. Leave the cities, like Enoch, come from your retirement to warn the people of the cities. The instruction is still being given, move out of the cities. So this kind of counsel and many other statements were, were grabbing me, but you know, there was, there was a little glitch in everything for me, because in the little book, Country Living, on the last page is this statement. Uh, penned in 1885 from Testimonies, Volume 5, pages 464 and 465. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. So I say this was a little glitch because I read all this counsel about getting out of the cities, but that statement seemed to make pretty clear to me that the time was still future, that it was not, this message did not have the urgency. Sure, country living is nice, but it's not a necessity at this time because the implications uh, would, would seem to lead us to conclude that that's what we do when we see the National Sunday Law. So for years, really, 
I held that as a reason not to make this such an urgent matter, as I believe many Seventh-day Adventists have, and many still believe that this is not of urgency. It's nice that these ad agra people are into country living and gardening and farming, but it's not a necessity at this time. It's not urgent. That's what many people think. What confused me was that I, earlier in the little booklet, Country Living, we have statements like this. The message the Lord has been giving me. Said the messenger of God. So an angel is delivering a message to Mrs. White saying, we need to get out. Well, I really started to, to look at this. I thought, so, this doesn't make sense. Why would the council be so clear? And why would we read a statement like this? Testimonies, volume 6, page 195. Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Now, that appears in the booklet Country Living earlier, on an earlier page than this statement. But what were we told? When this assumption of power takes place, then what time is it? Time to leave the large cities. And, and yet in... Volume 6, it says, get out of the large cities as fast as possible. So I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. Have any of you heard my presentation, The Abomination of Desolation? So, you know, I haven't been hammering this a lot. And, there, and there's a reason, and maybe I can get to the reason why I haven't been, you know, emphasizing this so much as I was some years ago. And I've re received a lot of flack on that message, too. So let me try to just um, distill it and, and simplify the concept. I looked at it, just the council at face value. Mrs. White said something's going to happen. When that is, and we can all talk about what that is, but when that is, whatever it is, then it will be time. And then there came a time where she said, it's time. So looking at it face value, I concluded Whatever that was talking about, that assumption of power, it must have happened because she said that then it will be time. And she said, the time has come when, as God opens the way, families should leave the cities. Interesting, as God opens the way. <clears throat> so if you just reverse engineer this, something must have happened between 1885 and... 1900, and we can actually tighten the window, something must have happened. We all know the National Sunday Law hasn't passed, but I would venture to guess that most Seventh-day Adventists don't know anything about something that did happen just three years uh, after this was pinned. Um, a fair number of Seventh-day Adventists do know about this event, that I'm going to mention, but they don't understand the significance of it. But really, probably most don't know anything about it anymore because hardly anyone ever talks about it. And in 1888, there was a lot of alarm in the Seventh-day Adventist Church because a senator, Senator H.W. Blair, entered a bill to Congress, and now it's referred to as the Blair Bill in history. And if that bill would have been passed, it would have been the first national Sunday law. Now, I concluded that there must have been significance in that event. And I didn't just posture that. I discovered a statement that Mrs. White wrote in January of 1889. It was published in the Review. At least, that's when it was published. Maybe she even wrote it at the end of 1888. I don't know, but, that, but it was published in the Review in 1889. It was in reference to the hearings on the Blair Bill. You know the church was alarmed.